Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Conscious Grief series. Today, I'm very excited to be with Marlene McConnell. Welcome, Marlene. Hi, Tara. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So good to have you here, Marlene. Marlene is a newly published author. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> it's so excited for you. You're a podcast you. host and a self-love teacher and trauma healer. And you are also an attorney. But this is your sort of new life, as it were, as an author, podcast host host self-love teacher and trauma survivor so well I know we're going to have a great conversation we've got so much to talk about today um and you're somebody that has really been through an awful lot Marlene um I'm sorry for all the experiences that you've had to had to endure but also so grateful that you're here to to be the ray of light so perhaps, Thank you. <laughs> to, perhaps to start, you can share with our listeners a little bit about your life story. Yes, sure, for sure. Thank you, Tara. So um, I think, you know, my, uh, my story starts really at the age of, I think, 23, when I was a young student and I was home uh, or at least I was at the restaurant where I worked and I then left the restaurant to go home because I had a shift later that evening and on the way to my apartment I kept on thinking you know my dad just bought me this new car I should really turn around and go get the new seat covers that I wanted but every time I got a chance to do that, I didn't do that. I carried on and I went straight home. But little did I know that, you know, my chilled afternoon was not going to be the chilled afternoon that I envisioned. What laid ahead for me was absolute terror. I didn't realize that there were people that were actually planning a home invasion. And so when I came home, you know, I had basically... Uh, arrived home I ran upstairs and uh, you know the next thing I knew there were people in my house and grabbed me and um, it was just absolute horror from that point onwards so what happened there was you know I was brutally attacked I was uh, uh, raped I was beaten I was strangled and my place was completely ransacked um, and I survived the ordeal and so <clears throat> you know this sort have happened um, at a time in my life where, um, you know, I was a young student, I had like my whole life lying ahead. And it really shattered that worldview that I had of, you know, this doesn't happen to me, this doesn't happen to people that I know. And, you know, the world is a benevolent and a uh, beautiful place where this does not happen, but then it did. And so my complete worldview was shattered and it really impacted my life for many, many years to come. And this followed, of course, another traumatic experience, which was for my parents, which was that six years prior to my brutal attack, my eldest brother was um, killed in a motor vehicle accident. And it wasn't a, just as straightforward as one would think, you know, he was an activist, he was an amazing big brother, an amazing son, and amazing dad and husband. And, you know, he was a school teacher who ran for mayor of the small town that he was in. And he then decided that he wanted to help the parents of the children in his class because in South Africa we had something called the DOP system. It's no longer legal in the country but it was where um, farm workers would be paid with alcohol um, for their services rendered and he educated the farm workers in the area around uh, human rights and their rights and alcohol abuse and there were many who didn't like that and we had this beautiful dinner at his house. And um, I remember it because it was the last dinner before he was killed. And my dad had some concerns because he had taken some of these cases on. And the next week he was due to represent somebody um, uh, in court. 
um, not as an attorney, but as an advisor. And there had been rumors circulating at the time that um, of his impending death. And my dad was getting very concerned about this and asked him, you know, and I remember him saying to my dad, you know, dad, if they kill me, then there will be another person to rise instead of me. You know, we have to, um, you know, educate and I can't leave everyone. You know, we have to fight for this. And so approximately uh, 2 a.m. two days later, we got the news to uh, find out that he um, had been involved in a single motor vehicle accident just outside of the town. The passersby had called the ambulance, but it took them two hours to get to his location. So he bled out in the field. And my parents and my, or at least my father and my younger brother then went the next day to the morgue to identify his body which, you know, in many ways was just a smaller trauma within our bigger trauma that we had suffered. And the, the, there was a police investigation and, um, you know, it was found to just be inconclusive. And the people who were with him to this day refused to talk about what had happened. So for my family, you know, grief and, and, and loss in, in a different perspective for especially my parents um, going through this with their eldest son and then again six years later with their youngest daughter was definitely something that impacted us as a family you know, tremendously. Tremendously, yes. I'm so, so sorry that you all had to endure these things and for the loss of your brother. Thank um, you, Tara. Yeah, really. And I... I wonder, being a sibling, how how that impacted you? Because I know that sometimes people's automatic response can be about the parents. Did you often find that in your experience that people maybe dismiss your grief a little bit compared to your parents? I, the way I was seventeen years old when this happened to him. And we are, um, you know, a big family, so we have many siblings. And I think that the grief was so much and the loss was so huge for my parents that it did kind of overshadow everything. And um, we had to take a backseat to the grief, you know, all of us. Um, I remember my, my, my second eldest brother, you know, you know, he felt sort of like he had now had to step into the shadow of my eldest brother because, you know, he, 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 he everything was now about him. Um, you know, my eldest sister grieved in her own way. You know, for her, the shock was so much that she had miscarriaged at the news. So she had the loss of her baby, her unborn child, and my brother at the same day, on the same day. Um, you know, um, for my sister and I, you know, we were still living at home. So we had to endure and see the grief that my parents uh, were going through. And so I think for all of us, you know, my parents' grief was just, it consumed them. And we had to take that second, uh, that, that back seat. Um, and this carried on for about five years. And um, if I look back at it, you know, I, I feel almost like, in those five years, I had to watch my family fall apart because we, we drifted apart because of our grief. Yeah. I'm sure many people who are listening to this can relate how families, you know, in with the impact of such grief and trauma, it does affect everybody differently and it can pull people apart. Um, even it, you know, even the well-meaning good relationships, it just, it, it's devastating. And, and also like the circumstances of your brother's death. So I imagine that that took up a lot of time to kind of try and, and you know, emotional energy to try and figure out what, what happened, you know, what was the truth beneath, beneath your brother's death? Yes, Tara, definitely. Um, I think that, you know, my, my parents, they, they struggled with the fact that they had some information prior to his death. Like I said earlier, you know, my dad was concerned for his uh, well-being because of the rumors that were circulating in town. 
At the time, it was 1994. So um, in South Africa, it was a, you know, it was a time of change. It was the year in which we had our first democratic election um, for our first black president, Nelson Mandela. And it was the end of the apartheid regime. There was a lot of um, uh, political um, instability and unrest at the, um, at the change in regime at the time. And so, you know, um, I think when my parents found out about this, they, you know, my, they, they probably thought that, you know, this could still be in connected to this violence that was ongoing. Um, and so it was, it was hard for them to make sense of it, but they, they grieve differently. You know, my, my father, he, both my parents, actually, they couldn't imagine a life without my brother. Um, so they kept looking back at uh, the life that was there with him, you know, and they also, they couldn't imagine looking ahead to a life that didn't include him and didn't have him as part of our family unit. And, and so in my dad's case, you know, he kept looking back. And even today, when I speak to him about it, you know, he wanted to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And he, um, did everything he could. He took it to the highest courts. He um, he he wanted uh, his body exhumed. He had forensic reports. He, he hired private investigators. And you know, for him, in that five years, he came to the conclusion that there was a third force group that had opera operated in the area, and they were responsible for many mm, hits, if, if it were. And, you know, through many investigations, my dad had come to the conclusion that my brother had been murdered by one of these groups in the area, which they knew who it was, but it was difficult to prove in court. And also the um, exhumation was uh, denied. And so there was a lot of blocks for him, but that was his way of coping with his grief. I think in many ways, you know, my dad needed to make sense of the fact that he had an answer and he knew what happened and it was his truth. And with that, he could live. And for my mom, you know, she became very disconnected. I remember my mom always being so sad. And every Sunday we had to uh, leave because we lived about an hour's drive from uh, my brother. And every Sunday we would get in my car, in the car, my mom and my dad, my grand, myself, and we'd go to the graveyard and my mom would just sit there and she would just cry. And we would just sit in the car. My dad would get out, we put some flowers and my mom would just sit there and cry. And so she became very disconnected and she retreated within and she stopped talking, um, you know, and she, she cried often. And, you know, as I watched her, I learned that, you know, when she was quiet like that, she just missed my brother a little bit louder, just a little bit louder, you know, and, so I, I was constantly faced with one parent that spoke all the time. You know, he couldn't stop talking about it. Everything was about it. Our dining room table was constantly covered in piles of papers and research. And the other one just retreated and didn't speak at all. And so, you know, I watched my parents as they just became so lost in their, in their grief. And... I think that, you know, once my dad in many ways, you know, found a way to make sense of it for himself, you know, he could sort of slowly start to, to come out of his, his grief, work through it. And I think that my mom, in her own way, she um, met a woman who also had lost um, a child. And, you know, people started to come around to the house who she didn't know, but who had lost children and had heard of her grief. And, you know, they would come and, um, you know, show their condolences and spend time speaking with my mom. And I, th and I think, you know, my mom sort of found her, um, her solace in the stories of others. Uh, she could identify that there were others that had the same pain because it's the kind of pain that, you know, um, I think very often we think no one will understand because it's, it's, it's like a dagger. It's like someone kicked you in the stomach and it's such a pain that numbs you, you know, and you don't think anyone can understand how, what that feels like. But um, 
in that community of families who had also experienced loss, you know, my mom, uh, she could find that, um, you know, a way to move through her grief. And I think, you know, the traumatic experience, once again, it's, um, you know, we talk about this benevolent world where, you know, children don't outlive or parents don't outlive their children. But I think, you know, it allowed my parents to, to restore their own worldview and accept the world as a place where they did outlive their son. But, you know, as a family, once they got to that place, they also started opening up to the rest of us, you know, and we could feel that because we felt the isolation. We felt the walls that they were building. Every time I came into the house, I saw this pile of papers on the table. Daddy is sitting behind this table, you know, that you couldn't speak to him. He, he was involved in what he was doing. Mom was sad. You could crawl up next to her, but, but she was sad most of the time. And so, you know, once they, after about five years, managed to come to a place where they had worked through their grief, they allowed us to come in. And I think at that point, you know, it allowed for them to remember my brother and his family because he had children and we forgot about them <laughs> because we were so sad about his life that was no longer there. And I think that um, one of the important things that my parents learned was, and also for us was that, you know, even if you don't know um, what to say to someone, a bereaved person, you know, just coming alongside them and just being there for them, even if you don't know what to say or simply just saying, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm, I'm sorry that you're going through this kind of pain. Um, you know, that helps. You know, you don't need to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember I, I interviewed someone once um, and he said something so beautiful. He said that he calls it the ministries of presence. And he says, you know, I recommend that, you know, you just come alongside the bereaved person and, and just tell them that you love them. And just tell them that if you are a man or a person of faith, tell them that you're praying for them, mm -hmm. you know, because they're not forgotten. Mm -hmm. And um, and that that is what that community did for both my parents, you know. And in many ways, it 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 saved our family, because mm -hmm. after after that, we we could manage to move forward as as a family unit and sort of find our way back to one another. Yeah. And then shortly after that, you know, not forgetting the incredibly traumatic experience that happened to you. Yes. That we started the interview with. Um, absolutely horrendous. So yeah. you were left completely traumatized, I imagine, from this situation. Your parents yeah. were just getting to the point of, you know, reintegrating with the world and being able to sort of look forward without your brother. And then you had to deal with this horrific situation where you were attacked in this sexual violence. Yeah. Um, how did I, you manage to support yourself through that, Marlene? Um, I think that, you know, when it, when it comes to to just the grief and the loss that I suffered as a result of it, you know, um, very often when we think of grief and loss, we think of it as a, to the death of a loved one, you know, but for me, there was a loss that I suffered that day because as much as I fought um, physically to stay alive, uh, you know, somebody died in that room that day because the person that left that room was not the same. You know, I was completely changed. My world was changed. The way I viewed everything was changed. I never trusted anybody. Um, so the life that I was supposed to live was gone. 
And people say, you know, um, oh, she's starting to, you know, um, hang out with her friends again, and she's back at university again. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing all of the things that I did before, um, even still dating the same guy that I was dating at the time, you know, but, and to everyone else, that seems to be, you know, how you, um, how can I say, you heal, mm -hmm. because you're falling back into the same routine that you had before. And in many ways, it gives everyone around you comfort that they can breathe, mm -hmm. because they are all kind of holding their breath, wondering, you know, we don't know what to say, we don't know what to do, How's it, how is she going to so when you go back to um, your normal routine, it seems like that, but it, it's not really. I think that when it comes to grief and loss, you know, when you talk about sexual assault, um, you know, you don't necessarily think of it in in the sense of, um, or, or you talk about grief and loss, you don't necessarily think of it in the sense of, you know, sexual violence. But for me, I I was grieving the life that I thought I was going to live. You know, and I mean, today I look back and I think I don't even know what that life was, you know, but I was sad about it. Mm -hmm. I was sad that I that I no longer had that that life. And, you know, I think that as um, sexual uh, survivors, we sometimes grieve that we we grieve the loss of the life. We grieve if it was sexual violence, you know, where, um, you know, there's an abuser, you even grieve the the loss of the abuser, you know? Um, and so, so the grief was part of my healing journey. And, you know, uh, in my initial days and months and weeks afterward, you know, I spent a lot of time in therapy, which started um, early on in, in hospital. Um, part of the team of doctors was a psychologist, mm -hmm. but um I didn't automatically feel the positive side of the healing journey. And, you know, I didn't make the best decisions or choices at the time simply because it was just easier not to do that. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, when you go through something like that, the natural reaction is to have absolute anger about it. Mm. You know, you are angry at God. You asking God, why did you let this happen to me? Why me? Um, and holding on to anger for me was just easier than to forgive. Um, I forgiveness wasn't something that I even um, thought of at the time. You know, um, for me, it was also easier to just self-loathe mm -hmm. because I couldn't love myself in the state that I was in you know and I couldn't I couldn't believe that there was anybody else in this world that would you know um in some way want to love or think about me in a positive light because I felt so tainted by this experience I, I felt so damaged by the experience and so, you know, I, I succumbed to, to self-pity because self-pity was just so much easier than to, you know, surrender to self-compassion. You know, I remember I was in hospital and I, I was lying in this bed and the nurse came in and she was offering me some compassion and she was saying, you know, Marlene, I know somebody that something similar had happened to and she was offering some kind words and in my mind all I could think was you know I don't I don't want your compassion I don't want to hear this I don't care about your the person that you're talking about you know leave me alone get out get out of my room but at the same time I wanted to say I'm so scared and I, I hate that this happened to me and and can you hold me and stay here because I'm terrified in this room? But I didn't do that. You know, I, I let her leave thinking that she'd done something wrong. And, you know, I, I, I chose to just stay angry. And I really let my anger over the years that followed fester, unchecked, and eventually turn into resentment you know, 
And, you know, I felt resentment against God. Uh, I felt resentment against the wrongdoers, the perpetrators, um, any possibilities, opportunities in my life. Um, you know, everything became so outwardly focused and I was so hell-bent on absolute revenge. I don't know where I was going to, you know, <laughs> inflict all of this, but that was that was how I felt. Um, I, I remember feeling that no one could see me and that my pain didn't have value because everyone seemed to just go on with their life. And I looked at their lives and it was all so perfect. And, you know, um, and it seemed like nothing had ever gone wrong in theirs, but yet mine was turned upside down. And so for many years, you know, I, I let all of these experiences just fest check, fester and fester. And it wasn't until many years later, with lots of help from my counselor or my psychologist, that I attended a, um, a fundraiser. And there was a very well uh, known um, survivor of uh, sexual violence and attempted murder. Um, and she was the speaker. And I sat there and I listened to how how she was speaking about her experiences and how she had turned it into something so positive. And, and I mean, this was a, an extremely horrific and brutal attack on her life. And while everyone was having the lunch, I sneaked out and I spoke to her, you know, and I said to her, I, I don't understand. Why are you doing this? Why are you speaking about this? Because I don't want to speak about what happened to me. And she said, you know, the fact that I speak about it is what healed me. The fact that I heal others is what heals me. And I said, but I wanted to die. That is what I wanted. I fought to live, but I want to die. And she said, yes, I also wanted to die. I, when everything was said and done, I sat on my couch and I wanted to die. But she said, you know what? The story was so much bigger than me. The media didn't allow me to. And so I had to, and I started telling the story. And she, she, she told me the part of her story that she couldn't get past. And she said it was the hardest thing for her. And she said it was the fact that I did everything that my perpetrators told, um, asked of me, but they still tried to murder me in the end. And she said, I could never get past the fact that these two people tried to really kill me. And I never thought of my attack um, as an attempted murder, which it was. And, you know, um, but I was so stuck on just the other aspects of it. And in that, something changed. And when I got back to therapy, I was talking to my a psychologist and I said, what just happened to me? And she pointed out, it's the power of speaking to survivors. Because when you, when you speak to somebody that have a shared experience on the level that really can understand what you have gone through, um, they can change your perspective about some of the things that perhaps you are stuck on. And that was what happened to me. And so when that happened, it really opened up um, uh, the last leg of my healing journey, which was really to move forward and out of um, a place of, you know, self-pity and self-loathing and um, resentment and anger, but to move forward into a place where there was peace and there was forgiveness and there was understanding and there was compassion. And through working with my therapist and through engaging with others that uh, through support groups, that was how I managed to, to access that for myself. And I became more confident in my story and I became more confident that I, I could inspire others, you know, that maybe feel the same way and maybe is trapped in the same darkness that I was, that darkness of absolute despair. And you, you cannot see the light. You don't know how you're going to get out of it. And, 
And so that was really what I, I did for myself. I also realized that, you know, um, there is always um, a choice that one has to make. Because once, once I spoke to this um, survivor and I was undergoing my own transformation and change, I had to make the choice to step out of it. And I had to choose me. I had to choose what was right for me and not what everybody else wanted. So the power of, of choice once again surfaced in my life as something that was um, pivotal in healing. And I think, you know, we, we sometimes we, we look outward, you know, um, for the answers. And I learned to really follow my intuition. I learned to look inward. I learned to, um, to respect that voice that told me that day, don't go home, go back to the mall. Because uh, that, that voice has never steered me wrong. Um, and, you know, I learned that if I do that, I am connected to self, to who I am. And to me, that is the Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it's God that lives within us. And, you know, it, it enhanced my faith. It strengthened, um, you know, my faith in God and my religion. Um, it helped me, you know, that realization helped me to be more open and acceptable to other faiths and also not only to religion, but also to spirituality, which played a huge role in my recovery because I understood that everything that happened to me happened for me and it was far more bigger than what I could ever have imagined. I remember my dad at the time when I was filled with despair and I hadn't yet gone out into the world. I said, daddy, I can't do this. I, I just want to die. And he said, you know, one day you are going to look back to this moment and you're going to understand. And I know that this is, this is a hard, very difficult thing right now. And, and we don't understand, but one day this, this will make sense. You will know. And I can say that my experiences now, they inform my life. You know, I can look at my pain and, and that despair that once consumed me and consumed every decision that I make. And I can now look at that from a place of understanding and I can feel the pain for my pain, but I, I'm no longer, um, you know, the pain no longer informs my decisions and, and who I am. Um, and, I, and, and I've moved on from that. I've moved through that. And I, I think the only way that we can move through these experiences in our life is to move through them. I think um, feeling our emotions and having a great awareness of the self and our sense of self is key in making that transition, you know, um, in, on the healing journey. And I think that um, for me, being at a place where, you know, I, I could now write a book and, and speak about this and I can come on this, uh, this conscious grief series with you and speak about it, you know, is a testament to the fact that um, we can experience post-traumatic growth. And uh, in statistics, statistics tells us that only 50% of people who experience traumatic experiences, you know, experience post-traumatic growth. But I believe that post-traumatic growth can be transformative. And I think that, you know, if, if we are indeed part of the 50%, like statistics tells us, you know, that um, when you experience the post-traumatic growth, you can see the the, the good that can come from a uh, unpleasant and a very dark experience in your life. And you can use it for the good rather than um, to use it uh, in any other way that could be detrimental to your own self, you know? Yeah. So inspiring, Marlene, really. I mean, I, I know for the purpose of this interview, we haven't even covered some of the other areas that you've overcome. Um, and I love that you, you spoke about 
life is happening for me, not against me. And I think that that's when we get that, when we believe that, and that makes sense for us in our lives, I think that that is a paradigm shift um, for people who are listening. And it might seem like a very um, alien concept for some people who've never heard that before. Uh, but I, I really do think if we are looking at life on that level, that everything that happens to us, even these painful, traumatic horrific things that we wouldn't wish on our worst enemy that somewhere somehow like your dad said we look back um I always remember the Steve Jobs uh talk that he did about you know connecting the dots like a dot to dot and it's not until you get to the end of your life that all the dots are connected and it makes a picture that you understand um which is which is where you are now. And I would love for you to just share a little bit more about your book, Ray of Light, um, and what people can expect from, from reading your book, which is out now. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Tara. My book, Ray of Light, I am so proud to say, is now on Amazon and it is available at 99 cents. Um, my book was, you know, uh, inspired by uh, me sharing my story at uh, cancer support groups because I am also a cancer survivor. I know we didn't touch on that, but um, and I, I could see that my story had value and I thought, you know, I'm only sharing one aspect of my life right now. So what if I share a bit more about my life? And so that was the inspiration for my 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 book. And so. You know, I always say that if you feel like you are trapped in, you know, this dark cave of life with only despair to guide you, 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 you always have to remember that you have to find the ray of light. And sometimes, you know, we have the light inside us, but we forget. And, you know, we, we forget to look because there are others that will shine their light for us. Whether that is a friend saying, hi, can I sit with you? Um, here's a shoulder to cry on. You know, that's the light that is available to us. And I've learned that even in our darkest moments, we are, we are not alone. And um, God is always with us. At least that's what I believe in my life. And, you know, um, I think that in my book, I want to try to, you know, um, bring forth this concept also that, when we go through all of these experiences, be kind to the person on the train, be kind to the person at the restaurant, the waiter that's serving you, you know, because we don't know what happens in other people's lives when we see them. And maybe just that smile that day is your ray of light in some darkness and despair that someone's going through. Mm -hmm. So cultivate and create that awareness through my book that we are the rays of light and we must be it in our own lives. And we can also be that for others, you know, when they can't see. And I, I try to bring a, a new and a fresh perspective just on healing and recovery and really just the journey back to self. And I use my own life and my own life experiences and I coupled it with um, stories from others who have been so generous and gracious to share and trust me to tell their stories. And of course, um, I, I back everything up with, with research. And I think that, you know, in my book, I want to show that there is always a choice to step out of trauma. And, you know, you can have joy and inner peace. And the reason why I chose joy and inner peace is because joy and inner peace are the two things that I never had after my um, attack. I couldn't feel joy. Even if you told me the most wonderful news or I saw the most beautiful sunset, I couldn't feel joy. And I definitely had no peace. I didn't have peace in any fiber of my being. And so once we step out of trauma, that that for me is the two things that you can have and um and so yeah so I, I engage my readers to you know find their light be the light in the darkness and um yeah and yeah <laughs> and I hope that that uh, that message you know uh gets gets out there and inspires and um and so yeah I know people can buy the book on Amazon and um 
you're going to ask people who are listening to this about writing a review. Yes. So, um, so my book is available on amazon.com for 99 cents. And um, I am a self-love teacher with the Heal Your Life. And that is the 10-week course that I offer. And if you buy my book on Amazon and leave a review, your name will go into a drawer and I will choose four people and, you know, who I will um, give a 10 week session, a heal your life session with me. And if it's not something that you want at the time, then you can always just offer it to some, someone else. Amazing. So we will put a link to that um, book underneath this interview and um, where can where else can people find you and contact you, Marlene? So I have two social media pages. Um, one is on Instagram and Facebook, and the handle is My Centered Life. Amazing. And my last question for you before we complete, it's just your own interpretation of the concept of conscious grief. What do you think conscious grief looks like? I think for me, conscious grief is about developing that awareness within oneself as to the process of the grief that we experience. Because I think when 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 it happens to you, it's difficult to to, to cultivate that because everything is so overwhelming. But I think that, you know, you reach a point in where the loss is so much and the grief is also a lot, but you, you reach a turning point where you say, I can, as I'm moving through this, I can start to distance myself because I can start to see a different perspective. Um, of what I'm going through and what I'm experiencing and and so I think that that for me at that point is where you know grief becomes more more conscious for the person that's experiencing it Um, and I think that when we do that it makes it a little easier to navigate Wonderful. Marlene, thank you so much. I feel very blessed to be one of the first people to interview you. I know that you're going to have many, many more of these to do. And so thank you very, very much for being here and sharing your story. It's so, so powerful. And it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for thinking of me and for the invitation. I um, am truly grateful and I'm excited that this is the first um, series that I'm involved in to speak about my book. (laughs) Yes. And thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. Bye. Bye.